Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, Marsha. Hi, Betty. Here we are again. We've been spending all of our time about this far apart from each other in the van. <laughs> Two and a half weeks of being this close together. Sometimes we're as much as 20 feet apart. So last night I think might have been the furthest we've been apart yeah. the whole time. Yeah. Because I slept in the van and she slept inside the little studio. Yeah. <laughs> So we've been on this trip uh, for a couple of weeks now. We did a workshop almost three, three weeks. weeks. It feels like about a year. <laughs> um, we did a workshop in San Diego and Oakland and Portland and um, various readings in between and camping in between uh, various sweet places. We were in Big Sur and Redwoods and Ocean Beach. And so, yeah, we, we yeah. got to camp three nights on the beach and that was very fun. This was basically a, an excuse for a nice camping trip. <laughs> but it's been, it's been also great to meet all the new people and see people we know and share what we're working on. Um, so that's what we're doing here today. It just occurred to us that not everybody, um, not everybody lives on the West Coast of the U.S. And, and <laughs> there, who knew? Um, so, yeah, we wanted to to do something that we could invite people to from farther away. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been reading to lots of people and we've been reading sections of our book. So I, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Marsha Bachinski. I'm the co-author of Creating Consent Culture, a handbook for educators. And Betty and I have been friends and colleagues and collaborators and schemers and <laughs> since 2006. I think so, yeah. Um, I am the co-creator of Cuddle Party, and Betty came on very early on in 2006 to check out what we were doing, and she liked what we were doing, and we liked what she was doing, and she joined the board for Cuddle Party, and now neither of us are on the board for Cuddle Party anymore, because the organization's been around for so long, um, but uh, yeah, I created this, I, my co-author Erica approached me, she's a Cuddle Party facilitator, and she approached me about um, four or five years ago and was like, hey, um, people in my small town are really freaked out by cuddling. Do you mind if I take some of these exercises and turn them into uh, non-touch based exercises? And I was like, of course, please do. We want consent education everywhere. So she kind of developed a workshop that was very similar to the principles we talk about in Cuddle Party, but no cuddling. It was more the, the somatic practice of asking for what you want, saying no, noticing incongruity between when you say yes, but you mean no, um, changing your mind, all of these kinds of things. And she started workshopping it on young people and with friends and it went really, really well. And then in 2019, she said, hey, will you write a book with me? And I love her so, for so many reasons, but one of the reasons I love her the most is that she is, she, once she has an idea, she does not let go of it. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. We can do that if you can wrangle my schedule. Help me wrangle my schedule. And so we kind of met periodically and I was like, I don't know if this is going anywhere because I'm really busy. And then in 2020, I suddenly had my calendar very free. <laughs> and <laughs> so this is what I did on my COVID vacation. Uh, and we, we wrote a book that is, uh, each chapter it's, it's the subtitle is a handbook for educators, educator here defined very broadly. So if you are a community leader, community builder, if you work with adults, if you work with young people, this will be helpful for you. It's kind of marketed to educators of young people, but it's really meant for a broader audience. Um, and each chapter is a concept that has to do with consent culture. And then uh, um, sometimes there's a story from either me or Erica or both. And then um, an exercise at the end. And then at the end of the book, we put it all together into a three hour workshop that you can teach. And she's putting together a little facilitator training for people who want to teach that. I want a little more support, but it's all there. And um, yeah, people have been responding really positively to it. It came out in January. It's selling well. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to read from it today. It's an awesome book. You should get it. <laughs> I'm Betty Martin. I'm the author of 
the art of receiving and giving, the wheel of consent. And the wheel of consent is a practice in taking receiving and giving apart so that you're doing either one or the other. So when it's for you, it's totally for you. It's what you want. And of course you're respecting the other person's boundaries. And when it's for them, it's what they want. And you are giving to them what they want within your own boundaries, of course. Um, and as a practice in taking, receiving and giving apart, in particular, it's about noticing that who is doing is a different question than who it's for. So if my hand is trailing down your back, is it doing what I want it to do or is it doing what you want it to do? And noticing that that's different. And um, so this, the work came out of my work with clients um, and the game that I learned at a workshop called the three minute game. Um, and it's, this grew out of that. And uh, it took quite a long time to write because I had a hard time with it. So the, this, that, there's a way, lot of nuance in this yeah, book. It takes yeah. a while to get nuance And out. it's, um, it, it takes you into a lot of detail about how to actually find the experience. Because what I noticed in working with clients is that um, a little bit of instruction would get them going and then they'd get lost or they'd get confused or they couldn't figure out. So, so the book gives quite a lot of detail, um, which is why it's so darn long. Um, so Marsha, what is consent? Oh, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. I haven't written about that. Let's see. However, I did not mark the page. So hang on a second. <laughs> um, so we define consent culture in chapter two, starting with defining consent. Consent culture is a common phrase, but what does it mean? Let's break it down. What is consent? One of the most common misconceptions about consent is that it's about getting permission. While permission is a part of consent, a permission-based model is limited in that it doesn't create space for more than one person's desire or wanting. Getting permission often sounds like this. Is this okay? Can I do this? May I do that? While permission isn't at all bad, it's a limiting model. It assumes that one person has the thing and the other person's job is to get the thing. Whether that's sex, a job, money, help, love, attention, dinner, or something else, this gatekeeper model is about getting something, not creating an experience together. Permission is a part of consent. After all, some situations really do boil down to, may I have a cookie? But there are a whole range of experiences that are more interesting and satisfying when they're created collaboratively. In short, a fuller model of consent is an agreement about how we're going to interact or share space together. It's not about permission, it's about agreement. It's not about getting consent, it's about creating consent, but it's not as complicated as you might think. How do you create an agreement? You propose stuff, the other person proposes stuff. Then you go back and forth until you know what the agreement is. Kids do this all the time on the playground, but we seem to have forgotten the skill as adults. Kid A, let's play tag, you be it. Kid B, no, I don't wanna be it. Kid, okay, I'll be it, and they're off. This is an example of an agreement where the rules are pretty well understood, it's clear. But if you watch kids, they build elaborate worlds with rules and desires that change constantly and are inscrutable to outsiders. They improvise and they throw stuff out there. They keep talking and they fight. Then they sort it out and they keep going until they're done or bored or it's time for dinner. In other words, it's ongoing, mutual, and specific. This is consent in action. You can quit anytime you feel like it. You may not have an exact script of what will happen, but check-ins are happening along the way. There are five key skills at play here. One, saying what you want. Two, saying yes three, saying no, four, changing your mind, and five, creating space for other people to do the same. When you are creating an agreement, you are inviting the other person or people in. 
sharing your enthusiasm for them and the ideas you each have for a positive experience, giving room to say yes or no, allowing yourself and others to have a voice about what's on the table. In general, it's a good idea to avoid pushing for a specific experience. Instead, put several fun, pleasurable, and acceptable options out there. Then find what, out what the most mutually comfortable and fun one is and play with overlapping interests. Sometimes you'll be creating agreements about something that is no fun at all, like planning a funeral. Even then, offering a variety of options that are acceptable and as positive as possible will make it a less terrible and more cooperative experience. If it's a maybe, it's a no, especially at first, until more trust is built. Don't let scarcity or fear of not getting what you want drive your interactions. You might be surprised at what other cool experiences might happen when you each put what, what you want on the table and create agreements together. As you can see, agreements are much more nuanced than simple permission. A good consent agreement is clear, informed, voluntary, sober, act in person specific, ongoing mutual and active, but in no way does it need to be formal or stuffy. Cool, yeah, thank you. Some years ago, after I had been teaching these consent workshops for 10 or 15 years, I um, decided I should look it up in the dictionary to see what consent actually was. And I was a little surprised because I had, I was thinking of consent as, as Marcia is describing this collaborative agreement that we come up with together. And what the dictionary says is that consent means agreeing to do what someone else wants. Well, that's great, but that's only half the question. Um, so, but it did explain how we get tangled up in talking about consent in, um, in public discussion and, and culture um, and why it gets tangled up with permission. Um, because if, if there's something that I want to do to you, then I do need your permission. But if I want you to scratch my back, where does permission fall in there? It doesn't, it just doesn't fit. So, um, so looking in the dictionary was a great aha for me. <laughs> um, I'm going to read about a, a concept. Well, talking about boundaries, boundaries is a word that gets used a lot of different ways. So you may, when you say boundary, you might mean what you're not willing to do, or you might mean this is this belongs to me and that doesn't belong to me, or um, you might mean the the edge of your yard. And so, if you're having an argument about boundary. The first thing you should do is check and see what your definition is because it's quite likely you're using different definition. <laughs> um, but this is an idea that grew out of that question of noticing that boundary is a word that gets used for a lot of things. <clears throat> it's about a concept called domain. My friend runs a wolf sanctuary, taking in orphans or those born in captivity that have lost their homes. What a place to learn about human nature. Wolves are both familial and territorial. They know their home and defend its borders. My friend's acreage is large, but not unlimited. Each pair or small pack has its own domain, and many of them share the opposite sides of a chain link fence. She tells me that they are peaceful with their neighbors, all of whom they can see and smell. Proximity is not a problem, as long as the fence is up. If the fence came down, holy havoc would ensue. Even though each family would have just as much space as before, they would defend it against each other fang to fang. Not a scene I would care to witness. This got me to thinking about boundaries and domain. Boundary has so many meanings, it's easy to misunderstand. When you say boundary, do you mean something you don't want to do at the moment? Do you mean privacy, your right to choose, or some other aspect of what's yours? A more useful idea may be domain. For the wolves, the fence is their boundary. The space enclosed by it is their domain. In our personal domain, live those things we have a right to 
and those things we are responsible for, and they are the same things. I have a right to enjoy, use, develop, explore, and claim certain things as my own. I have responsibility for those same things, to respect, nourish, and tend to them. They go together. No one can take them away, and I cannot give them away. With that, let's look at a few distinctions. These are the ways I use these words. They're certainly not the only way to use them. I give them to you here to clarify the distinctions between them. Domain. Domain is what we have a right to and a responsibility for, such as our bodies, desires, and feelings. What is in our domain does not change. We are always responsible for it. What is included in my domain? My body, and my inner experience, desires, feelings, pleasure, pain, fear, the whole gamut. I have a right to experience them and I have a responsibility for them. I don't get to blame them on someone else. I have the right to say no and I have the responsibility to say no. I can't blame anyone for, reading my, for not reading my mind though I have certainly tried more than once. I definitely have tried. <laughs> the more we take responsibility for our domain, the more freedom we have. Perhaps more important is that when we own what is in our own domain, we respect what is in others. It follows naturally and automatically. Boundary. With this understanding, we can define boundaries. As I'm using the word here, I mean the edge of your domain. Your boundary is what delineates what is inside your domain from what is not. It's the fence around your domain. Limit. A limit is a choice about activity. It is what you are willing to participate in and what you are not. A limit is your no. You have some limits you will not do at all for anyone ever. And other things you are available for depending on who it is what the situation is or how tired you are. You might set a limit today and change it tomorrow or five minutes from now. Limits change, and this is a good thing. For example, I'm happy hugging almost anyone most of the time, except when I'm not. My boundary hasn't changed, owning my body, but my limit has when to hug. The stronger your sense of domain, the more responsibility you take for your limits. And then your limits can become flexible. Flexible means the ability to, change, to respond to change and still take responsibility for yourself. That lets you enjoy any situation because you know you're able to choose and communicate. This is not the same as being a pushover. Um, Recall the thought experiment about entering a room in which you can't say no. That was a, that de described in an experiment where if you imagine entering a room full of people and the rule is that you're not allowed to say no to anyone there, can you even enter the room? No, you can't because no, no matter what they ask for, you have to say yes to. Um, so it, it's an example of how the ability to say no is what allows you to be close to people. Um, so the ability to say no allows you to enter the room. The essence of respect <coughs> is taking my own domain to heart and allowing you to do the same. The primary language of respect is consent. When a person owns their own domain and respects the others, they are naturally more careful about consent. Converse is also true. If you are not using consent, question your respect. Or it could be that you feel respect but don't yet have the skills to express it. What we owe people is accurate, relevant information and respect of their domain. That's it. Woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> Good stuff, y'all. Good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would love to hear a little bit uh, in the chat if you feel like sharing. Uh, thank you for putting the links in. I appreciate that, uh, Jane. Somebody was asking for the links, so they're in there. We'll we'll post those again if you want to buy the books online. Um, but I would love to hear from folks in the chat a little bit of 
maybe about why you are interested in this topic. What had you show up today? Um, if you feel like sharing, it'd be nice to see. Let's take a moment and let people write. I forgot my water. I'll go get some, some tea. Nah, <laughs> thanks. That was an example of an offer. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Let's see. Mm. I love that people are attracted to this kind of culture. Thank you. Yeah, when we're in the room with people and doing the reading, we, we always like to leave time for discussions and questions and noticing that's a little harder to do here, but. Great. Thank you. Worked as a social justice educator, cyber work reference by Kai Cheng Tom. And I was, I don't know if I'm saying that name right. Yeah. Yeah. And I was excited to learn more about the next steps, more nuance around consent culture. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. One thing that has struck me, it, well, I've read Marsha's book before, of course, but listening to it over and over, um, what has struck me is the part about consent culture that we're not just learning the consent skills for our own use, but it actually contributes to the culture around us. And, you know, it seems like, well, duh, of course, but it just struck me the other day, like, oh, right. That's why the book says creating consent culture. <laughs> oh yeah, it just took a while for me sink in yeah, yeah i'm a big believer that all of us have the capacity and are, in fact are already making consent making culture like we are all culture makers in what we do the norms that we set around us the things that we allow especially if we're in a, in a leadership role of any kind parental role um ma managerial role any of these kinds of things um but even just like, yo, dude, that's not okay, is culture making. Um, so anytime we're kind of helping to set or reset the norms around us, that is a form of making culture. So we all have that capacity. And that's one of the things I'm about. There's so many good comments in here. Yeah, thank you. We will be making this audio available. Um, wonderful, wonderful. People are saying different ways that they, beautiful. Mm. Yeah, it seems like there's a mix of personal and professional interests. I love this. Oof, yeah. Yeah, this is beautiful. This Thank is great. you. great, yes. Love yeah. seeing this education happening. Love seeing the personal development happening. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, great. Okay. Um, I'm gonna read again. Yeah. yeah so, oh yes, love seeing. Oh, I just want to keep reading all of these <laughs> things. They're so great. Ah, uh, y'all are so awesome. Okay, so Betty was talking about domain, and though I do think it's a bit of a misconception, I think there's two common misconceptions about consent culture. One is that it's always about sex, and two is that it's always about saying no. Um, and it is much more broad than sex. And it is about so many things, including, and we talk about in the book, asking for what you want, changing your mind, apologies and repair is also part of consent culture. So, because we will have consent incidents and accidents. Um, but I'm gonna piggyback on what you okay. just read okay. and talk about why is it so hard to say no? So this is just a section of the chat of that chapter about saying no. Um, and there's a few different things we go over, but I'm going to read one section of it. This work of creating consent culture sometimes feels the hardest when it comes to teaching people what to do when there were no. In the last chapter, we talked about how no is a skill that needs to be learned. If only that was all we were up against. <laughs> there is a phenomenon that happens constantly. An incident happens. An authority figure is creepy with a child. A man is aggressive with a younger woman. A white woman touches the hair of a black woman while giving a quote unquote compliment. This incident doesn't rise to the level of assault or rape or any legal definition. 
but something is most definitely off. The interaction is decidedly non-consensual and contains unwanted sexualization, objectification, and or entitlement. Like clockwork, when the incident is reported, someone almost always asks a variation on, why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you tell them off? Why didn't you fight back? Why didn't you say no? And then we go into my story. When I hear stories like this, I want to give the long answer that most of us have had our no undermined in a thousand ways that are almost imperceptible as they are happening. Yet we internalize it. And unless we've had excellent modeling, support and practice, it becomes extremely difficult to say no to things we don't want happening to our bodies. Within the realm of consent education, when we talk about feeling safe to say no, we are talking about so much more than a threat of violence. Threats, explicit, implied, or perceived, are certainly a factor in limiting our ability to say no, but the truth is our issues with saying no start long before then. In chapter five, we talked about the gatekeeper model of permission, in, which is what many people's concept of consent is based on. Person A wants the thing, touch, sex, closeness, whatever, and persons B, person B's job is to just say yes or no. And while getting permission is a far better approach than simply taking action on another's body, the gatekeeper model has some serious limitations. One of them is that it depends on people's capacity to say no. This gatekeeper model is, is happening inside of a larger culture of coercion, which constantly undermines and dismisses people's no, especially with young people. Authoritarian parents, teachers, and religions teach children that no is an unacceptable response. This training and socialization, plus power differentials, manipulation, actual and perceived threats of violence, and the body's autonomic freeze response just begin to scratch the surface of the myriad reasons why saying no can be so hard for so many people. Furthermore, sometimes we appease others because it feels like it is the only option we have. It's about more than just saying no. This undermining of, our, undermining of the no affects more than just your capacity to say no. It affects your ability to even notice the body's signals that something is not okay with you. When the people around you and your cultural stories consistently model that what you are supposed to do is bypass any preferences or boundaries, you learn to internalize that those things don't matter. In a culture of coercion, it becomes a survival skill to learn how to tolerate or endure being treated as a means to someone else's ends. Finding your own boundaries, preference, or pleasure is not even on the table. When being a no is not even an option, saying no becomes impossible, and the so-called consent that is given is empty. This is why I get so angry when people ask, why didn't you say no? And then we go back to the book part. It's not just, just, not just me talking now. <clears throat> in consent culture, we make room to notice the no, both in ourselves and in others. We learn how to receive a no as information, not rejection. And we proactively create safety and reassurance when someone is a no and says so. These things are absolutely crucial for the development of noticing a no, feeling appropriately entitled to your own no, and then saying it. That's a really big, important part of consent. <laughs> it is. Yes, it sure is. It sure is. Hmm. And um, yeah, I, I want to switch and look at the other side. We've been talking about the, the boundaries and the ability to say no and set a limit. And as we said, when we started out, that's only half of the picture. The other half of the picture is being able to notice what it, what does sound wonderful and fun to you and articulate that and ask for that. Um, it's the desires part, because if all you, if the only opportunity you have is to say yes or no, you're going to get kind of tired of that. You need an opportunity to bring your desires forward. And the, the practice of the wheel and the three minute game creates that opportunity. It's built in um, because you're taking turns asking each other what you want in a particular way. So, um, uh, so it's, a, 
it's a great way to gradually learn to give yourself time to notice what is it that, that I actually want right now. So I'm going to talk about desire a little bit. One of the things in our domain is our desires. My mother was in her 50s when we kids were home from college and talking about going out to eat. I asked her, what would you like, mom? She said, well, honey, I don't know. No one has ever asked me what I wanted. Knowing her family background, that statement was probably true. No one had asked her and she had long since forgotten how to know. I have asked hundreds of people how they would like to be touched and noticed a huge range of responses to being asked. And before I say I've asked hundreds of people, that's because I was seeing them as clients, not because I was accosting them on the street. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recommend walking up to someone on the street. How would you like to be touched? Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> um, so I was working with clients at the time. I have asked hundreds of people how they would like to be touched and noticed a huge range of responses to being asked relief, gratitude, confusion, or embarrassment. Some feel put on the spot as if they're supposed to produce something. Some feel lost as if they don't know what the question means or suspicious of why someone would want to give them anything. Some deflect by saying anything you want. Common of course is, I don't know. All these reflect a relationship to our own desire. We fear our desire, crave it, deny it, shame ourselves for it, or try to hide it. We're worried about not having enough desire or having the wrong kind, or we've forgotten how to know what it is. We walk right over it or ignore it. Nothing but trouble. The whole thing is mysterious. But what is it? Many people think of desire as sexual desire, but I use the word more broadly here. It's whatever you want or prefer. A hug, a walk in the woods, a cup of tea, a better situation at work, social justice for wage earners, protecting the coral reefs, or as quoted in the introduction, less dioxin in every mother's breast milk. Desires are your want to list. Desire is essential and innate part of who we are. Our lives depend on it. It points to what has meaning and value for us. Your desire and choice is a sacred trust. You're the only one who can carry it. If you don't listen, no one can. Hoping someone will guess correctly and get it right is a self-imposed jail sentence. The only option is to go along with someone else's or what you think is someone else's, which may or may not be accurate. The outcome whether immediate or eventual, is resentment. Your desire dries up and then you forget how to know. As I said elsewhere, resentment is a sign to ask, what did I want that I didn't ask for? Why we distrust it. I sometimes ask people in a workshop, who here heard this from their parents? And I, I invite you to, to ask yourself this, who here heard this from their parents? Gee, Susie, I can't give you that thing you want, but you sure do a great job of wanting it. I'm so proud of you. I have yet to have anyone raise their hand. Most of us learn from an early age to distrust our wants or that they are shameful or make us weak or vulnerable. I talked about this in chapter 18. We learn that what we want doesn't count or is not the right thing to want. We spend so long not listening to ourselves that eventually we forget how to want, more accurately, how to notice, trust, and value what we want. It's risky, there's no way around that. We risk disappointment and possibly ridicule. It feels safer to not let desire show, but when we don't acknowledge what we want, some part of us has to shut down. We give up and forget it's in our own domain. We try to put it in our partner's domain and try to get them to want what we are afraid to want. Um, and then I go on about um, developing the ability to notice what you want. And really the whole practice is about 
that, developing that ability to notice what you want. And it happens mainly by taking the time, slowing down and taking the time for it. Yeah. This is nice. Oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. Club. Yeah, we go around. We actually <laughs> blurbed. We didn't realize it, that we both are the first blurb on each other's the back of each other's books. <laughs> so I'm going to go on a little bit of a limb here and read a section I haven't been reading um, in the other readings because it seems like this might be relevant to a lot of people here. Um, and this is from the chapter Backup, Not Backlash. And it's a fairly ambitious chapter because in a few pages, we're trying to shift people from a punitive model of accountability to a more restorative justice, transformational justice, collaborative, uh, healing, repair oriented model of accountability. Um, and so I'm going to read some of it. I'm going to skip some sections and then I'm going to read some other things and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> One of the most powerful transformations that we've experienced as consent culture creators is the way that the values of collaboration, respect, equity, and bodily autonomy have shifted our views about what should happen when people cause or experience harm. For decades, it has been the case that anytime some, anyone with less power speaks up about a consent violation, it's swept under the rug. Even worse, the person who reports or even just insinuates that something bad is happening gets backlash for saying something. It happens when a young woman is chastised to think of his future. It happens when a boy is shunned for reporting a priest or rabbi's molestation. It happens when a black child at school is told, it's okay, they didn't mean anything by it. There are countless more examples, but the common response pattern in coercion culture is hide the problem, then make the person wish they never said anything to begin with. Oh boy. The good news is that slowly, if unevenly, this is shifting. In creating consent culture, we have a chance to interrupt these patterns and find new ways to teach accountability. So then we have a whole section about moving from punitive to restorative justice that we use sexual assault as the model of when we talk about the many, many reasons why people, it doesn't, the system doesn't work the way we currently have it. And then lay out some different models of restorative justice, uh, transformational justice. Again, very ambitious chapter. Um, and, and then we talk about how, what this looks like is gonna be very different depending on the group you're talking to and the age of the people that you're talking to, whether you're talking to young people, older people, before or after an incident has occurred and so forth. Um, and then we go on and on. And then um, I wanna say, it is crucial to note that an accountability process is distinct from arbitrary and illogical punishment. A true accountability process may be challenging to undergo, but is not punitive, and the process is in service of healing and restoration of relationships. In consent culture, an offender will learn that they're expected to take responsibility, be accountable, learn to do better, and apologize meaningfully, and that they will be expected to follow a course which attempts to repair the harm they have caused. And when a victim is supported by society, they will receive backup, not the usual backlash. Consent accidents and accountability. The fact of the matter is that many, if not most, consent violations are accidental, particularly among young people who are still learning to navigate the world. Accidental, however, does not mean trivial. The impact may still be monumental. Think of a car accident. Sometimes it is the tiniest shift in an angle that makes the difference between walking away shaken but unscathed or being airlifted to the emergency room. Often people will say it was an accident as an attempt to minimize what happened in a consent violation, but it's the impact on the person who was harmed that matters. If someone didn't mean to violate consent, their intent is relevant information. Accidents happen even among people who care about one another, but that it was an accident is only one piece of information and not a, not a reason to avoid healing and repair. Sometimes it's not an accident, but it's not exactly malicious either. This is especially true among young people who are exploring their boundaries and capabilities. Sometimes from the perspective of, I kind of know this is wrong, but I want to see what I can get away with. 
<laughs> and sometimes from the perspective of, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but this is kind of like what I've seen modeled. So I'm gonna try it, see what happens. In both cases, this is why consent, addressing consent violations early and often is crucial for building consent culture. When adults and peers are willing to say, we don't do that here, whatever the that is, it helps to establish new norms. We can give guidance to young people who are trying out the coercive ways of interacting they've seen modeled and support them in taking a step back, assessing, taking responsibility for their actions and apologizing. We can guide them by listening, collaborating, showing compassion and backing up victims. Everyone makes mistakes. We all mess up. It's part of being human. From a developmental perspective, young people are still figuring out some foundational pieces of how to interact with others. This is why they need some extra room to make mistakes without, di without dire or possible viral consequences or feeling that there is no way back. The new term of canceling is just another way of saying shunning, which humanity has been engaging in forever. Ostracism is a common and deadly form of punishment since time immemorial. Belonging is so crucial that humans will often sacrifice autonomy or dignity to attain it. If we expect that people can behave better, then we need to give them a way to get there. Young people and older people alike can learn to take accountability, apologize, and make restitution. Some people deride calls for accountability as mob rule or cancel culture and would prefer to go back to sweeping everything under the rug. By providing structure for people to take responsibilities, and by appreciating their efforts towards making amends, we can shift this narrative. Whether a consent violation was acted out intentionally or accidentally doesn't necessarily change the harm to the person who experienced it. They still need the same support regardless of the intent or the age of the perpetrator. We need to back them up. How can we as adults stand by young people who are experiencing something that is not okay with them? And how can we encourage their peers to do the same? How can we acknowledge that we all, but especially young people, need space to learn these interpersonal skills without it becoming an environment where the most powerful people get to make mistakes at the expense of the less powerful? Where the more powerful people learn that they are excused when they cause harm and the less powerful learn that they're expected to tolerate and endure. In moving away from a dominant culture of coercion, we encounter the problem of who gets to learn and who gets learned on. Mm. Building an equitable environment where we can create agreements together requires undermining reflexes like boys will be boys. She didn't mean it like that. He apologized so she needs to forgive him. If they were truly Christian, they would forgive. We can't just believe one woman. False accusations are common. Oh my gosh. Imagine if we all had more compassion and respect for ourselves and others, practice asking and hearing each other without shame and had each other's backs in, assert, in asserting new norms. And then we go into some concrete hows on uh, how to be an upstander, not a bystander. And then we go into, oops, I messed up, now what? And it talks about what to do and then also how to make apologies. <laughs> um, and then we go into the workshop skills. So that, that's, a, that's our ambitious chapter. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Mm. Yeah. Um, any more uh, thoughts or questions or noticings? And and then um, would you read that summary? Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. yeah, you all have any questions for us? Just drop them in the chat. A million. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta read the books <laughs> yeah even then you might have a million yeah mm, yeah mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah yep yeah oh great you can just fan club us we're yeah. okay with that just too <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful everybody showed up. Yeah, me too. It's wonderful. Me too. We will um, uh, post the recording so people who didn't scroll down to the bottom of the email can still find it. <laughs> All right.
Shall I do one more reading? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is from uh, chapter 15, which is right before. It's, the it's actually the last chapter, but there's a lot of the workshop and so lots of notes and, and index and all that good stuff after that. It's called Practice, Practice, Practice. In this book, we have outlined the basics of building consent culture. We have talked about the skills involved, saying yes and no, what to do with a maybe, how to ask for what you want, changing your mind, looking for the enthusiastic yes, listening well, de-escalation and intervention techniques, reading body language, and apologizing well. We have also talked about the shifts in the attitude that underlie consent culture, respect for bodily autonomy, understanding power and privilege, and collaboration rather than permission seeking or gatekeeping. We have reviewed the freeze response and some of the ways it's been misunderstood. We've talked about how the law is the absolute bare minimum and that consent culture is about how to treat one another with respect and how to find what is uh, mutually agreeable and fun. As workshop facilitators, we have witnessed many participants, we have witnessed many participants have major epiphanies and make substantial changes in their lives as a result of experiencing a few hours in a consent-based social context. We also know from follow-up conversations that it takes practice to truly internalize a consent-based approach to the world, one where we each expect our own bodily autonomy to be respected, we each respect others, and we work together to find mutually agreeable interactions as often as possible. And then we go into my story and then after that Erica's story, but I'll just read my story. Learning consent is not one and done. Even after nearly 20 years of facilitating cuddle party events, teaching consent in my classes, supporting individuals in their repair processes and consulting for community building and incident response, I am still learning about nuances of consent and finding things to unlearn. There are times I still railroad over another person because I want to believe that what they are saying isn't important or doesn't apply to me. There are still times when I'm flummoxed by a stranger who feels entitled to crowd my space or make comments about my body. As a white person, I am still in a deep lifelong unlearning process around the ways I have been taught to disregard and dismiss the words, experiences and bodies of people of color. As a woman, I still have to navigate the sometimes shocking and sometimes terrifying ways that some men casually dehumanize or sexualize me or other women. As a child of a chronically ill parent, I am still acutely attuned to some forms of disability while I catch myself being wildly oblivious to others. As a user of the internet, I'm still tempted to jump into the fray to be on the right side when some juicy drama is going down. As a workshop facilitator, I have to remember to slow down when I get pushback on something that seems obvious or foundational to me. Learning about consent helps to give me the skills to do this and solid ground to return to when I feel defensive, angry, dismissed, or demoralized. It's not about taking a consent class and saying pass, fail. It's about how we practice these skills in our lives. You don't have to become a consent expert or even have the correct words. You just have to choose to live as much as possible from a place of respect, curiosity about other people, and a willingness to figure it out together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love hearing all those, there are still times, there are still times, because that is so true. Yeah. Yeah. Someone asked last night at the reading if because we've been practicing and teaching for so long that we have it all figured out yet. And um, I just burst out laughing because <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and you're I, I like your description of it there. Yeah, I think I was saying last night that um, it is so valuable to learn these skills because it makes so many interactions so much easier. And it also kind of gives you a superpower in seeing through your own and other people's bullshit. Um, and there are still times when it's really vulnerable and really hard. And so when, you know, when it's not vulnerable and hard, it, 
it's like people think you have a superpower because you're like, wow, I can just identify what I need and ask for what I want and change my mind and listen to other people Mm -hmm. and take in other people's nose as just information. And it's, it really smooths out a lot of interactions. Uh, But then when it's vulnerable, it's vulnerable, man. (laughs) Yeah. I think one thing that practice has done for me is, is um, let me see my own mess ups more clearly. Yeah. I, I can just see, oh my gosh, I really blew that one. Yeah. And that's more clear than it ever was. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not blaming other people um, so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would like to see the consent culture. I'm a retired high school teacher. I would like to see the consent culture training as a part of teacher continuing education. I wonder if there are some who have had positive response from schools. Um, Mm. so I'm in a unique position in that my co-author and my publisher are the ones with the connections to the school and the educational system. Then I'm over here mostly teaching adults, (laughs) but that being said, um, we do have some stuff under development that we're trying to get rolled out before the next school year, including an online, um, mini course, uh, through our publishers platform on like just some tips on how to teach this stuff. And then for those who want to really get trained on how to teach this um, so they can bring it into schools and youth groups and community organizations and that sort of thing, um, Erica, my co-author, is putting together a training for the fall to get you trained and certified so that you can go in as a certified um, educator for this kind of, for this workshop. So um, if you go to consent culture, creating, if you go to creatingconsentculture.com, you can find out about that. the book has only been out since January. And so um, a lot of the teachers are really just getting it in, you know, in their hands this year. So I'm imagining we'll see feedback and more rollout in the fall when the new, the new school year starts. So that's what and, my publisher tells me. <laughs> they, could, they could find out about that training by going to here, the I will website. Just, I will in. just put it in okay, here. Beautiful. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we are like teetering on top of a pile of books here, y'all. <laughs> it is real janky. We make it look good, but it's it, it could fall apart at any moment. <laughs> oh, that's not right either. It's also not my keyboard, so I'm not used to how it works. There you go. So you can get the, all of that kind of stuff there. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, is there any way to stay in the loop in case you host any, uh, any other online events? Yeah. You can get on my newsletter or Betty's newsletter. Um, both. Uh, if you follow also, I'm very active on Instagram and Twitter. Um, ask. <laughs> at ask. Marsha B is my handle on both of those. Um, and you can go see our van tour on Instagram, which I was very <laughs> excited. Did you put it up already? I put it up yesterday. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. So if you want to see the van that we're traveling around in and uh, that I'm very excited about, <laughs> you can go on Instagram and watch the reel I put up yesterday. Uh, hold this here i'll hold this now and hold that so it doesn't fall apart okay uh at the oops wheel oops (laughs) i keep putting spaces of consent that needs to be in it it's hard to type it's hard to type at the angle yeah Um, and we're at the wheel of consent on instagram um, and bettymartin.org um, you can join the newsletter and but Instagram everything will be announced on Instagram uh, what we have coming up yeah and then if you go to Betty's site too what is it the wheel, wheel of consent book.org wheel of consent book.com dot com wheel of consent book.com Thank you all thank everybody. you buy our book oh which yeah go to creating consent culture.com or here hold that I'll do this HTTP wheel 
Wheel of Consent, Consent. Book. Book. com. Yeah. You can buy our books at those two websites. And thank you so much for coming. Every time people show up to these things, it touches me so much. I know that you're off doing your thing over in the world, wherever you are. And I just want you to, yes, I just want you to, <laughs> if you want to hold up your book, you can. <laughs> hold your book up. Oh, oh there look you at go. that. Yay. Yay. <laughs> um, it really, it really means a lot to me because y'all are out there doing the work, whether it's just trying to learn about it for yourself to change patterning you got growing up or you're leading or teaching or facilitating it really yeah you, you know it really makes a huge huge difference um to everybody yes <laughs> i love it oh man this makes me so happy so thanks for being here y'all thank you take care on the internet you say chat